In Ecuador, after 19 days of national strike, the indigenous movement and Guillermo Lasso's government signed a peace agreement for dialogue. Peru's President Pedro Castillo resigns as member of the Peru Libre Party. In Spain, at the end of the NATO summit, the U.S. President Joe Biden announced a new shipment of war material to Ukraine worth 800 million U.S. dollars. Hello, welcome to From the South. I'm Luis Alberto Matos from the Telesur Studios in Havana, Cuba. We begin with the news. The Confederations of Indigenous Nationalities and the government delegation headed by the Secretary of the Interior signed a peace accord to initiate the dialogue process with the mediation of the country's bishops' conference. During the meeting, the president of the Ecuadorian bishops' conference, David de la Torre, read the act requiring the cessation of the mobilizations and the gradual return of the indigenous communities to their territories. The bishops' conference stressed the need to moderate the scope of the demands to facilitate the agreements and promised to guarantee the fulfillment of all the commitments reached during the negotiations. The presidents of CONAI, FEINE and FENOSIN declared the cessation of mobilization and the gradual return to the territories, as well as the suspension of all acts that could affect peace and public order. Ninth, the national government commits itself to repeal the state of exception in force to the extent that peace is reestablished in the Ecuadorian territory. The president of the Confederations of Indigenous Nationalities of Ecuador, Leonidas Isa, warned of the need to build a state and a society that guarantees respect for the diversity of the peoples. We need to overcome a lot in order to build, in this case, a plurinational state, an intercultural society that really tolerates the rest, that really values the rest, that really contacts the other. That's still lacking, but let not leave those efforts to the indigenous people. It is an effort of the whole society, this society of whites, mixed, indigenous, blacks, Montuvios. Let's make an effort to build a dream society and respect each other. The Minister of Government, Francisco Jimenez, pointed out that the signing of the agreement is not the end, but the beginning of a national reconciliation. We cannot allow violence to take over Ecuador. We cannot allow our differences to deepen. Today is not an end. Today is a beginning. Today is the first day, as Eustachio said, of this great dream of national reconciliation. Quito's Monsignor Luis Cabrera pointed out that the agreement signed is the result of the sum of the wills of all sectors while thanking the Ecuadorian people for their willingness to solve their problems in a peaceful manner. The peace agreement that we celebrate today is the result of the active participation of each and every one of us. For this, I wish to express a word of gratitude. Thanks to the Equatorian people for their great heart and wisdom in facing and solving the country's problems. Thanks to the indigenous organizations for their flexibility and openness to all sectors of society. Thanks to the government for listening to the clamor of the people and responding to their demands. Chile has extended for the fourth time the state of emergency decreed on May 17th for the southern macro zone. The Congress obtained a total of 101 votes in favor, 19 against, and 13 abstentions, slightly smaller margin than about 15 days ago when it got 126 votes in favor. According to supporters, this measure which is in force in the Araucania region has served the military to protect routes and roads. In relation to the situation in the Araucania region, according to the Minister of the Interior, Iskia Sishes, the state of emergency has also served reduced violence in rural areas by more than 30 percent since its implementation.
The Secretary of Health, the Mexican state of Jalisco, Fernando Peterson, confirmed two new cases of monkeypox in tourists. The official explained that there are now nine people infected in the state, while he warned that two suspected cases are being followed up. He also explained that the first sick person was a U.S. tourist who presumably was infected in Texas and was vacationing in the state's coast in May. On the other hand, Peterson ruled out the existence of community transmission as he assured that all those infected contracted the virus through contact with foreigners. In the United States, several drugstore chains have temporarily limited orders of contraceptive pills following the annulment of the constitutional right to abortion decided by the Supreme Court. Among the pharmaceutical chains that have regulated the purchase of such pills are CVS, Rite Aid, Walmart, and Amazon, which establish limits of purchase between three or six units per week of the drug. Some of them have the intention of regulating the demand so that there is a constant supply but others are in line with the decision of the Supreme Court. It should be noted that the highest judicial body in the country annulled the ruling that granted freedom to terminate a pregnancy and thus has put an end to the constitutional guarantees that protected women. We're taking a short break. Join us again after this. Welcome back to From the South. Peru's president Pedro Castillo resigns as member of the Peru Libre Party. Castillo's decision follows the request made by the leader and the founder of the political party, Vladimir Serrón, to leave the group. Serrón had issued a communique on June 28th in which he stated that the president had promoted the breaking of the party unity through the fracture of the ruling party's bench by inviting dissidents. Since the beginning of the current parliament in July 2021, Peru Libre has been losing members steadily due to internal struggles for the political leadership of the organization. Peru's Prime Minister Animal Torres denounced the intention to hide the nation's corruption and crime problems through judicial accusations against the government. Torres warned that such accusations against the executive lack support, evidence, and call for transparency within the country's institutions. The president of the Council of Ministers alluded to the investigation that the Public Prosecutor's Office has opened against the president, Pedro Castillo, for allegedly being a member of a mafia that operated inside the Ministry of Transport and Communications. Finally, Torres urged the judiciary and the public ministry to combat crime in Peru. In the Dominican Republic, the Dominican Liberation Party celebrates this Thursday the 113th birth anniversary of former President Juan Bosch. Representatives of the Departments of Youth and Gender Equity and Equality are scheduled to host both the national and the PLD flags this Thursday at the National House of the Purple Party, an act that will be headed by President of the organization Danilo Medina. Juan Bosch was one of the leaders of the Dominican opposition in exile against the regime of Rafael Trujillo for more than 26 years. He was elected president of the Republic in 1962, a position he assumed for a brief period in 1963. His government was overthrown by a coup seven months after he had assumed the presidency. Nicaragua's National System of Prevention, Mitigation, and Attention to Disasters held a meeting to design the action plan to face the arrival of Tropical Depression II. Through a big conference, authorities presented the forecast of the possible scenarios once the system touches land. The forum was attended by representatives of the regional governments of the northern and southern Caribbean coast, the mining triangle in the southern part of the country. The meteorology director of the Nicaraguan Institute of Territorial Studies Marcio Baca informed that the potential tropical storm would enter the southeastern part of the country by this Friday afternoon.
According to the trajectory and the information we have at this moment, it is expected that it will be approaching Nicaragua in the afternoon of tomorrow Friday or in the first hours of tomorrow Friday to the coast between Laguna de Perlas and San Juan de Nicaragua. It is expected at this moment that it will arrive as a tropical storm. The U.S. Supreme Court imposed political limits on federal government to regulate carbon emissions. The top U.S. court on Thursday ordered the restriction of some functions of the Environmental Protection Agency under the Clean Air Act. The court's action will limit the federal government's ability to combat climate change. Groups of court justices noted that the ruling raises new legal questions about any decisions federal agencies make. President Biden's administration announced that despite the restriction, it will continue to work on new environmental regulations. In India, the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare recorded 18,819 new COVID-19 infections and raised the total number of carriers to over 100,000. After over 120 days of relative control of the virus, the nation is experiencing a rebound despite the fact that more than 1.9 billion vaccines were administered and the recovery rate exceeds 98.5%. According to official records, 104,555 people are still infected and the accumulated number of deaths is 525,116. Protesters marched in Manila on Thursday as Ferdinand Marcos Jr. was sworn in as the new Philippine president. They call on the public to remember the atrocities committed during Ferdinand Marcos Sr who plundered and brutalized the country during his 20-year rule. We are here to show that we will continue to stand up and be with our countrymen in holding the government accountable and for the incoming administration. We are here to show that the voice of the people should prevail even amid fascism, repression and poverty, and the church will stand with them. More news coming up after a final show break, so don't go away. Welcome back to From South. The President of the United States, Joe, Joe Biden, announced that he will make a donation of $800 million in additional arms aid to Ukraine. During a press conference at the end of the Enough and Lucky Tree Organization Summit, the President Biden ratified that his government and allied countries will help Kiev for as long as necessary. He also pointed out that after the summit in Madrid, the bloc has been strengthened as a response mechanism to what they consider Russia's intention in Ukraine. On the other hand, the U.S. President informed that he will ask the countries of the Persian Gulf to increase oil production to combat the price of crude at a global level. President Vladimir Putin warned that Russia will respond reciprocally if NATO military infrastructure is deployed in Finland and Sweden. The head of state assured that Moscow does not have with Finland and Finland those promises that unfortunately it has with Ukraine. The Russian leader warned that if both European countries want to join such a military alliance, they should understand that in the case of deployment of arms and infrastructure contingents, Moscow will be forced to respond reciprocally and create the same threats to those territories where hostilities are created for Russia. Ukraine's Ministry of Foreign Affairs informed on Thursday the breaking of diplomatic relations with Syria following the Arab country's recognition of the independence of the self-proclaimed Donetsk and Lugansk People's Republics. According to the ministry, Kiev is also initiating a procedure to impose a trade embargo against Syria 
as well as to introduce other sanctions against legal and natural persons. After Damascus' recognition, the leader of the People's Republic of Lugansk, Leonid Pasechnik, thanked the Syrian leadership for making what he considers a courageous and responsible political gesture. The organizations of all exporting countries and its expanded format, OPEC Plus, resolved to continue with the August Agreement to moderately increase crude oil production. Through a telematic meeting, the alliance established a quota of 43.85 million barrels per day from August, distributing 26.69 million for the members of the bloc and the rest of the 10 allied countries. The agreement is being renewed despite pressure from consuming countries to increase production and push prices downwards. Compliance with the quotas depends on producers being able to reactivate their operational capacity after the pandemic during collapse of the industry. To follow up on the agreement, the agency will meet again on August 3rd. At least 64 people were injured in Palestine following a violent incursion by Israeli forces on the outskirts of the northern city of Naples. Palestinian families, including four children and a baby, were taken to a hospital on Wednesday suffering of suffocation after inhaling tear gas fired by the Israeli military in the vicinity of the tomb of Prophet Joseph. The director of emergency and ambulances of the Palestinian Red Crescent in Nablus, Ahmed Jibril, said that medical teams also treated 12 other wounded who also suffered from asphyxiation. The Israeli military has been widely criticized for the widespread and systematic use of excessive force against Palestinians. On June 30, the Democratic Republic of the Congo commemorated the 62nd anniversary of its independence by paying tribute to former Prime Minister Patrice Lumumba, assassinated by the colonialist government of Belgium in January 1961, and whose remains were recently repatriated to the very party with honors. The event was attended by hundreds of thousands of Congolese, many of them young people who vindicated the struggle of Lumumba, a national hero of that country. Our correspondent Oscar Epelde gives us the details. He received the homage he never had as a national hero, just as Lumumba himself prophesied it would be done in June the 30th, the day of the independence of the Democratic Republic of the Congo. All these institutions of the state, the army, the government, political parties, religious confessions, traditional institutions have participated in, the, in this small but grandiose ceremony, headed by the President of the Republic and his, speech, his special guests. Different speeches have highlighted the value of Lumumba's ideas, sovereignty, solidarity, pan-Africanism, as well as the value of his new historical moment in which, having recovered his body and the truth, we celebrate the symbolic beginning of a new era in which it is the Congolese who write history. The new generation, the Lumumba generation, as they now call it, face the great challenge of safeguarding national unity and integrity and build, rebuilding sovereignty and solidarity so that the country's immense resources can be harvested for the good of the entire population. The Prime Minister, grandchildren, praise the young Africa that is emerging, that no longer has any complexes in the face of the West and that is fighting through entrepreneurship and social reconstruction for the same ideals as Lumumba. The president also advocated reconciliation with all the actors involved in the tragedy that the Congo experienced in the colonial past. It is only after having told the truth, after having established the responsibilities of all parties, that we can get together, Congolese and Belgians, approach the decisive moments of forgiveness, justice, and true and definite reconciliation. The President of the Democratic Republic of the Congo has highlighted Lumumba as a humanist and an inspirational figure on an international scale, calling on the Congolese people to keep Lumumba's memory as a place to revalue nationalist and republican ideals. Desde Kinshasa, Oscar Repelde y Gode Kalonji para Telesur. Telesur continues to grow its signal and reaches Europe. You can order it from your archive dealer or tune it yourself. These parameters that you see on screen are in place since July 1st. Quite soon, photo changes will be implemented for the signals in the Middle East and Africa. 
Now more than ever, the world connects to us and our stories are heard in other faraway nations. This news multi-platform will continue providing truthful content to oppose the hegemonic media's narrative and unfaithfulness to our audience. We've come to the end of this news brief. Remember, you can find this and many other stories on our website at telesolenglish.net. You can also join us on social media, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Telegram. For Telesol English, I'm Luis Alberto Matos. Thank you for watching.